Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War. In my last episode, I talked about artillery and the types of cannon that were used in the Siege of Vicksburg. So I thought I would continue with the artillery theme today and uh, talk about uh, an account of uh, the Siege of Vicksburg written by an art artilleryman. I really do think artillery is kind of the underappreciated uh, branch of service in the Civil War. It uh, really played a very vital role, particularly at uh, places like Vicksburg, but you don't really hear a lot from the men who actually manned the cannons. And uh, this account in particular is very interesting because uh, it involves uh, the crater at Vicksburg, one of the most dramatic uh, uh, incidents that happened during the siege. And of course, I gave it a, uh, a suitably uh, dramatic title, and it's taken from, uh, from this account. And uh, the title is, I Thought the Whole Confederacy Had Fallen on Me, A Story of the Death Crater at Vicksburg. And this is the story of John T. Wiseman, who was a soldier in Battery D, 1st Illinois Light Artillery. And uh, on that day, uh, he was witness to, uh, as I said before, one of the most dramatic incidents uh, of the entire siege. On June 25, 1863, the 3rd Louisiana Redan, one of the uh, Confederate earthworks defending the Jackson Road entrance to Vicksburg, disappeared in a choking cloud of flame, earth, and smoke as 2,200 pounds of black powder were detonated in a mine located beneath the earthwork fort. Uh, the blast gouged out a huge crater uh, where the face of the Redan had been, and into this debris set, uh, in, and as the debris settled, a Union assault force poured into the breach in the Confederate line, sparking a bloody fight that would last well into the night. And one of the soldiers who took part in this assault was John T. Wiseman, a cannoneer with uh, Battery D, 1st Illinois Light Artillery, also known as McAllister's Battery, after its first commander. And in October 1906, uh, Wiseman traveled back to Vicksburg for the first time since the war, and uh, he went for a very specific reason, for the dedication of the Illinois Monument at the National Military Park. And the visit uh, to the battlefield where he had fought as a youth was a very moving experience for Wiseman. And uh, after he returned home uh, to Nebraska, he wrote an article about his trip for his local newspaper, the Nebraska State Journal. And this account was published in the, uh, in the journal on November 11th, 1906. And uh, I'm just going to read you this account with a few uh, asides uh, as, as uh, I add some, uh, some commentary. But the, the article begins, At the Siege of Vicksburg, two guns of the battery held positions on the Jackson Road near the now famous White House, otherwise known as the Shirley House. The other two guns stood in front of the White House on the spot where the Illinois Monument has been erected, where Captain Henry A. Rogers and four enlisted men were killed during the siege. And just a note here, uh, Henry A. Rogers was the captain of uh, Battery D, 1st Illinois Light Artillery. And uh, one uh, Union officer, uh, Major uh, C.J. Stolbrand, uh, who was chief of artillery, wrote about him. He said, The untimely death of the truly brave Henry A. Rogers mars the pleasantries of my recollections of the siege, and his late command will long mourn his loss. And this was written just after the siege in his official report about the, uh, about the uh, uh, battery's actions during the Siege of Vicksburg. And this is a great, this is one of my favorite pictures of the entire uh, war. This is showing uh, some of the uh, Union dugouts carved into the hill just beside the, uh, the Shirley House, which was known to the soldiers, appropriately enough, as the White House. And uh, Battery D of the 1st Illinois was in a position very close to the house, the Confederate front lines were just maybe a hundred yards away, so they were very close to the front lines. And of course, the Shirley House is the only surviving civilian structure from the war that is still in the modern Vicksburg National Military Park. And this is the monument for Battery D of the 1st Illinois Light Artillery. This is a modern picture, and of course you can see in the background uh, the Shirley House. 
And Wiseman continues his, uh, his account. He says, Sometime after the charge of the 22nd of May, which was a failure, General Grant conceived the idea of tunneling under Fort Hill, <coughs> excuse me, called by the Confederates the 3rd Louisiana Redoubt. A tunnel was started a short distance from the battery and was run so as to reach directly under the fort. After it was completed, 2,200 pounds of powder was placed in the mine, and when all was ready, a fuse leading into the mine was lighted and a terrific explosion resulted, which hurled men and cannons up into the air. It was a sight never to be forgotten by those who witnessed it. One Negro who was tossed up with the earth came down on our side of the line unharmed. After the explosion, which formed a crater about the size of a half block, the 45th Illinois was rushed into the crater to make a lodgment in the Confederate line and try to break through, but the explosion had not accomplished what was expected, and the Confederates immediately went to work trying to restore their shattered works. After a short time, a squad of the battery under the command of Lieutenant Edgar H. Cooper, afterwards promoted to captain, was detailed to enter the crater to throw shells over the enemy's breastworks by hand, cutting the fuse at five seconds. While so engaged, David W. Ocker of our squad was blown to pieces by the premature discharge of a shell. A.D. Burr, Burr of this city and myself were in this squad. As we emerged from the tunnel into the crater, a hand grenade struck Lieutenant Colonel Reese of the 31st Illinois, which literally disemboweled him. And uh, just a note here, the Lieutenant Colonel Reese that Wiesman uh, mentioned was Lieutenant Colonel John D. Reese, who was mortally wounded in the fighting at the crater, and he died on July 1st, 1863, just before the siege ended. And uh, General John A. Logan uh, later quoted Reese as saying that after he was wounded, Tell Logan to tell the people at home that I died an honest man and a brave soldier. And then General Logan went on to swear uh, in, his, uh, in one of his writings, So help me God, I will tell them as long as I live that he died an honest man and a brave soldier. And then Wiesman continues his narrative. We stood for some time on the edge of the crater, waiting for orders, seeing sights which were well calculated to freeze the blood in one's veins. Over on the Confederate side of the crater, men were grappling with each other, some clubbing with their muskets, but at the same time they were gradually rebuilding their works. After a while, General Logan, Major Stolbrand, his chief of artillery, led our squad to the Confederate side of the crater, and we began to throw shells over in the midst of the Confederates, who soon returned the compliment by throwing shells by hand into the crater. It was my duty to hold a lighted taper with which, when the fuse was cut, I lighted the shell when it, when it would be thrown over the breastworks. I lay close to the enemy's works that seemed to me to be the safest place. During the fight in the crater, the Confederates rolled a cottonwood sapling over to our side, striking me square in the back of the neck. Although it was very light, I thought that the whole Confederacy had fallen on me, Jeff Davis along with the rest. After dark, the assault in the crater was abandoned, and the army settled down to a regular siege. And when Johnny Rebel had eaten his last steak of mule meat, Vicksburg was surrendered. I went to the National Cemetery, where over 16,000 of our boys in blue were buried, two-thirds of them in unknown graves. And as I stood by the grave of James W. Ditto, and this is a photo of his modern grave in the Vicksburg National Military Park. James W. Ditto, an intimate comrade of mine, and thought of him as he looked just before he fell 43 years ago. A fine, manly young fellow, scarcely 18 years old, the idol of the company, my eyes filled with tears. If the recording angel keeps a correct account, the men who were responsible for bringing the war between the North and the South will be kept very bu busy explaining matters to St. Peter when the big book is opened on the Day of Judgment. If the old veterans who were at Vicksburg during the siege should happen to go back there now, they would be surprised. 
Vicksburg is not the sleepy city it was then. The government has established a national military park dotted with fine monuments and markers laid out in beautiful driveways at a cost of millions of dollars. The city is booming and has taken on a new life. The visitors attending the dedication of the Illinois State Monument were royally entertained by the ex-Confederate soldiers. And he's right about that. Uh, uh, Vicksburg did turn out in big numbers, and it was quite a celebration. And there were a number of Confederates uh, involved in the, in the planning of the ceremonies. And I was really intrigued by Wiesman's story, and that's where his, his account ended for that one particular newspaper article. But I did a little more looking to see if I could find anything else about Wiesman, and uh, my efforts were immediately successful as I found a letter that he wrote to the editor of the National Tribune, which was the official paper of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, the largest union veterans organization in the country. And uh, in this article, he wrote again about uh, uh, his participation in the fighting at the crater in Vicksburg. And this is what he said in the second article for the National Tribune. He said, Editor National Tribune, I've been very much interested in your history of the opening of the Mississippi and take it for granted that you wish to be absolutely correct in your statements. Now, you give a minute, a minute description of what took place in the crater at Fort Hill and only mentioned what the several infantry commands did. You say that the shells were thrown by hand over the rebel breastworks by the tunnel diggers and the infantry. Now, as a matter of fact, not a single shell was thrown by any of them. Shortly after the explosion, McAllister's battery was detailed by sections to throw shells by hand, cutting the fuse at five seconds. Every shell thrown in the crater was thrown by artillery. Sergeant David W. Ocker was killed by a shell thrown from the rebel side, and by the way, he, he stands today in the Illinois state roster branded as a deserter. How is it possible that, that this brave boy who gave up his life for his country in that hellhole could be marked as a deserter? I cannot imagine unless it was done by some lunkhead clerk in the adjutant's office at the time the roster was printed. And he was correct about this. Uh, I actually looked up the roster for Battery D of the 1st Illinois Light Artillery that was published by the Illinois Adjutant General's Office, and in it, Corporal David W. Ocker was listed as deserted February 14, 1863. And uh, this was uh, uh, apparently put down by mistake because there was a notation that uh, the charge of desertion was removed on March 15, 1907. But uh, actually, after I did a little more digging, I found that Wiesman was actually incorrect that uh, Ocker was not killed. Uh, he actually survived the war and didn't die until 1890. In fact, he's buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Auburn, Indiana. He died January 16, 1890. And in fact, uh, uh, after he got out of the 1st Illinois Light Artillery, he mustered in with the 152nd Indiana Infantry in February of 1865 and served with them until the unit mustered out August 17, 1865. And the only thing I can figure is that that uh, Wiesman uh, believed he was dead. And that's not uh, hard to believe. If he got badly wounded, was taken to the rear, ended up in a hospital for a long convalescence, he, and never came back to the unit, everybody probably just assumed he was dead. Whereas he actually was probably sent to a hospital, slowly recovered. By 65, he was well enough to serve again, and he joined the infantry. Apparently, he was quite a soldier. But uh, uh, he apparently never uh, bothered to communicate with anybody in the battery, and they just all assumed he was dead. And I'm, I've, I've seen this happen before where, and, and see accounts where men that, that were thought to be dead would show up at reunions years later just because they had been carted off uh, uh, badly wounded from a battlefield. The men never saw them again. Just you know, They naturally assumed they had died and were buried somewhere on the battlefield. But uh, the article that he wrote for the National Tribune went on to say, uh, the artillery detail was in charge of Lieutenant Edgar H. Cooper, who after the death of Captain H.A. Rogers, killed during the siege, 
was promoted to captain and afterwards to major for bravery displayed on the battlefield of Atlanta, July 22, 1864. Major Cooper is still living and resides in Chicago. As to who threw the shells in the crater, it matters little, I suppose, at this late day, but credit should be given where credit is due. After the surrender, the 45th Illinois was given the post of honor, being the first to enter Vicksburg. McAllister's battery came second, following immediately after the 45th, and was the first artillery in to enter the city. John T. Wiesman, Company D, 1st Illinois Light Artillery, Lincoln, Nebraska. And this was published in the National Tribune, uh, December 27, 1906. And in the course of my searching, I did find a letter uh, written by Charles Koch, who was a member of uh, the Illinois Vicksburg National Military Park Commission, to William T. Rigby, who was superintendent of the, the Vicksburg National Military Park, concerning the part played by Battery D of the 1st Illinois Light Artillery. And uh, Koch had been a member of Battery D, so he knew uh, well of what he spoke. But he said in his letter to, uh, to Rigby, he said, June 25th came the day when Fort Hill was blown up. Immediately after the explosion, it having been discovered that the embrasure was not sufficient to permit our troops to march into Vicksburg, Lieutenant Cooper was called upon by General Logan and asked to furnish 12 volunteers for the purpose of throwing hand grenades over the works from the aperture made by the explosion into the enemy's works. Volunteers failed to respond, so Lieutenant Cooper asked how many men would follow him, and all responded, so that a choice had to be made of 12 men. Out of the 12 men who entered the crater, E.H. Cooper was unhurt, C.L. Pratt was unhurt, Francis Meek was wounded and died December 1, 1863 at Vicksburg. David Ocker killed June 25th. Now here's somebody else who again believed David Ocker had been killed when he, when he actually wasn't. Eli Sprague lost a finger. Chauncey I. Cooper had a flesh wound in the left thigh. Vincent Bowers wounded in the right leg. John T. Wiesman, flesh wound in the left arm. And you know, Wiesman didn't even mention that he had, he had been wounded. But again, it did say it was a, just a flesh wound, so he, he might have thought it was so minor it wasn't even worth mentioning. Uh, B.D. Washington, wounded in the right wrist. A.D. Burr, not hurt. Richard Henderson, not hurt. George A. Potter, not hurt. And uh, so you can see the casualty rate among those guys who volunteered to go into that death crater was pretty high. You know, so... Uh, it's amazing that any of them came out of it alive as close quarters as the fighting was and for how long it went on, because it lasted for literally hours. But uh, after the war, uh, Jane, John Wiesman moved about the Midwest uh, for a number of years before finally settling in Nebraska and becoming a railroad conductor. In addition to visiting Vicksburg, uh, he was at, very active in the Grand Army of the Republic. He attended reunions at uh, Shiloh uh, in 1895. And uh, when the old veteran uh, passed away uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, he was buried in uh, Wyuka Cemetery uh, in Lincoln. Uh, uh, he died May 31st, 1910. And uh, this ends the, the account of John T. Wiesman of uh, Battery D, 1st Illinois Light Artillery, and his account of the fighting at the uh, Death Crater at Vicksburg. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little account. If you did, please give it a like, and if you haven't subscribed to the uh, to the channel, please do. Uh, it's my, my best way of gauging interest in doing more of these kinds of videos. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them for me. I'll be glad to uh, respond to them as best I can. And uh, thank you so much for uh, watching.